Welcome everyone to this first session of the Foresight Existential Hope Group. The premise for the existence of this group is that we live at a very special time in the history of humanity, one that could change things drastically. Technology is developing exponentially fast, faster than our institutions, our brains, our societies can absorb safely. This is posing a significant number of challenges, the gravest of them all being the threats to the very existence of our civilization. But there is uh, one piece of good news, at least, to quote our guest speaker today, is that what we do with our future is entirely up to us. We are not hostages to fortune, tells us Bjorn, who is here today. And this is exactly why this group exists. While there are um, some efforts that are focusing on identifying and avoiding existential risks, what we do with this existential hope group is that we map the space of both the perils and the promises that lie before us in order to navigate toward the grandest, most extraordinary outcomes we dare to imagine for our future. And so for this first opening uh, keynote session, we really could not have hoped for a better guest than having Toby Ord um, with us today. Because not only Toby uh, produced some of the deepest thoughts and research on existential risks that exist, but uh, he also happens to have um, coined the term existential hope in a paper he co-wrote with Owen Cohen Barrett. In this way and in other he uh, deeply influenced the work we do here at Foresight, and I hope it is okay to say the word of the work of Alison Dietman, uh, Foresight president, who is also Toby's counterpart and speaker here today. I am extremely excited and uh, absolutely delighted to have you two together for this session today. Thank you so, so much for coming. And Toby, if you would do us the honor of please um, opening with your keynote. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I came up with, uh, with these ideas uh, um, with Owen Cotton Barrett. In fact, he, he perhaps deserves more of the credit than me. Um, uh, we, we got talking about uh, how to best understand existential risk. Uh, and then that is what led to these, these ideas of uh, new catastrophes and uh, existential hope. Um, so in order to kind of set the scene, I'll say a few words about, um, about different ways of understanding existential risk uh, and then how this connects and then what I'm currently thinking about this. Um, and then I'm really interested to hear what, what Alison has to say and start on that. So existential risk is an idea that was uh, kind of coined the, the term, uh, Nick Bostrom coined the term, uh, and he was thinking about human extinction and then kind of things which are relevantly similar to it. And he wanted to have some kind of way of talking about them. He noticed that uh, a particularly crucial aspect, if we zoom out and look at the, the whole history and future of humanity, um, comes from avoiding uh, risks such as uh, risk of nuclear war, which could lead to the end of our story. Uh, but other things like, a, say, if there was possible to have a stable global totalitarian regime uh, from which we couldn't escape, um, such as uh, in 1984, uh, the book, uh, or, um, or possibly a collapse of civilization uh, so deep that we could never recover from it, uh, that these would be relevantly similar to, to human extinction. And he tried to think about, you know, what would make them similar. And one of the aspects is that is imagining that, you know, we could do a lot now. Um, but we could do very little then. You know, the, the, the value of humanity at any point in time might be greatly reduced, perhaps even uh, to be worse than nothing um, in, in some cases of, uh, say, a totalitarian regime. Uh, 
And that there's something kind of special that it's not just that you lose the present, um, but that you lose the entire future. Um, and not just that you lose what we have here today, but that you lose everything that we could be um, if you were to suffer from such a disaster. And this is true most obviously for extinction, but also for other things that are kind of relevantly similar. So he wanted to capture that. And he tried to do this via a definition based on potential. Um, and we're gonna look at two types of definitions, potential and expected value. Uh, so uh, I, in uh, my book, The Precipice, I also go for a definition based on potential. It's, it's what I currently think is probably the best type of definition, but I'm, I'm still not, not sure about it. I really hope to sort it out by the time I wrote the book, because I was aware that it would probably lock in something of the definition. Uh, but ultimately, I spent quite a while trying to just, you know, really nail it and eventually had to decide to just, you know, put down my current best guess um, rather than delay the entire book uh, uh, for this. Um, but uh, how I define it is that an existential catastrophe um, is the destruction of humanity's long-term potential. Uh, and then that an existential risk is a risk of an existential catastrophe. Um, so humanity's long-term potential, uh, I think of as um, the value of the best outcome that, was, that is within our power to achieve. So there's heaps of futures open to humanity. There's heaps of ways that, that the future could go um, if we were to choose to, to send it off in that direction. Um, that some of these futures would be kind of constrained to the earth. Some might be uh, involving other planets or even you know, many other star systems or galaxies. Um, some might be quite short, some might be extremely long. Uh, some could be you know, very grim and bad and some, some could be exceptionally good. There's a lot of different things that if you imagine how every single human who lives now and lives in the future acts, that we could bring about. Now we couldn't do absolutely anything. You know, we couldn't perhaps travel faster than the speed of light, or um, you know, avoid other kinds of constraints based on physics and the situation we find ourselves in. But many things would be open to us. Um, and I think of our long-term potential as the best outcome that's available. And we don't have to agree or know which one that is, um, uh, but that it's the the best thing that is ultimately achievable. Um, and uh, what happens uh, if you have extinction is that instead of being able to achieve you know, these, these great things, the set of possible outcomes that we could achieve is just one. You know, it's, it's, there's, there's no choices left to make. And if we were to have a uh, collapse of civilization, again, it's a very meager set of possibilities that are remaining um, if we can't break out of that. So what's kind of relevant is that this kind of vast universe of possible futures collapses to a very small number of futures and that the very best ones are all gone. Um, so that's how, to, how I think about it in terms of potential. Um, yeah, that it destroys not just what we are, but what we could be. Um, and one thing to say about this is it's based around a kind of optimism uh, that if a great outcome were to stay achievable for long enough, that we would eventually achieve it. Um, uh, that if there are things that, that really are superior, um, then, and we survive for a thousand years and then another thousand years and then another thousand years. And it's still the case that we could do something, let, let's say settling the galaxy, um, and that that really is a really good outcome. Then why wouldn't we be doing it if it's not, you know, if we're not locked into some other kind of scenario, it's still, you know, a live option. Uh, you know, why wouldn't we get there? Um, so, you know, one could say more about that, but at its heart, there's a kind of optimism that it kind of, in some sense, identifies the value of the future with the value of the best achievable outcome. And that's what's going on there. Um, I should also say that the sense of potential is a very broad one. Um, it includes not just that, say, um, you might have said that in the year 1500, maybe in some sense, um, uh, air travel wasn't possible um, because it wasn't yet possible and th new things became possible once you developed the technological basis for them. I'm using potential in a broader sense where it's the kind of transitive closure of that, that everything that is potentially potential or something like that is potential um, because we in 1500, we're in the position where we could create the industrial basis and the scientific knowledge needed for air travel. Therefore, in this sense, it was still possible. Um, whereas other things might get locked off um, or locked in if we make kind of constraining choices. For example, if we used all our resources of a particular type. Um, so it's, it's a very broad sense. Um, the, the downside of that, though, is that our potential never increases, which sounds a little bit sad, um, but it's kind of built. Well, it's not quite true, but it's kind of built into the idea. So it's a very broad sense, uh, uh, but it then has a slightly depressing sound to it that doesn't increase. 
So the alternate way of thinking about it, um, which, uh, which Owen and I developed, was to think of it in terms of not potential. And we thought maybe potential is a bit of a wishy-washy concept that's a little bit hard to think about. And it has some problems. Um, and maybe the traditional idea of expected value is a better way to do it. Um, uh, so thinking about different probabilities, you know, different outcomes and how valuable they are weighted by their probabilities. Uh, now, then you could say, um, you could imagine what's the expected value of the long-term future of humanity. So kind of basically the expected value of the future, given that we are thinking from the perspective of humanity. Uh, and then, you know, um, let's say there's some value um, to that, some number, um, which is the expected value, takes into account the, all these different probabilities of different outcomes, some very good, some, some mediocre, maybe some quite bad. Um, and imagine that, that you kind of had a trace of that expected value over time, a little bit like a stock market, um, so, you know, a stock value. Um, this is, it turns out that the mathematics is the same as the mathematics of stocks, uh, which is convenient for us to understand it. If we didn't have a stock market, it would be a bit harder to understand. But it, it also is a somewhat kind of sullies the idea if you try to think of it in nice kind of like powerful terms, then you kind of compare it to a stock market. Um, but if you imagine this thing kind of like tracing over time, um, and then all of a sudden the expected value, you know, it goes up a bit because we, you know, we, we, we uh, improve our societal wisdom, you know, maybe it goes down a bit because we invent social media or something like that. Um, then, uh, then maybe it, it, it collapses, it goes down a lot. Um, uh, and uh, that could be because we make a kind of irreversible turn in how we govern, say, nuclear technologies or something like that. Um, maybe, um, you know, a nuclear weapon is fired, um, a single shot. Uh, but you know the expected value of the future may crash um, down by quite a large amount because it's very hard then to get out of a very difficult situation where, where the chance of it going to zero has become quite a lot higher. Um, and then the idea was to think about an existential catastrophe as a sudden drop in the expected value of the future. Uh, so um, this could do certain things better than the other definition. Uh, in particular, it deals with cases that are not fully in a inescapable. So you might think that an ines pre a perfectly inescapable totalitarian regime would be an existential catastrophe. But what about one if we enter such a regime, but there's, you know, a 1% chance we could still get out of it? Well, for the potential story, it's a bit unclear what to say about it. It doesn't fit quite cleanly, whereas the expected value story can just say that's 99% as bad as, um, as if there was no chance of escaping. Um, so it, it deals more cleanly with some cases, but it does have some confusing aspects. For example, we're now talking about probabilities of probabilities um, because the existential catastrophe was defined as these, the expected value going down and the risk was the risk that the expected value goes down. So it started to get a bit, you know, the, the, the technical apparatus of talking about this was a bit confusing. Okay, so they're the two different approaches. Um, and then the thing that, uh, that we noticed was that there's an interesting thing that could happen with this, with the kind of stock of humanity, like the, the kind of net present value of everything that we might achieve in the future. This could be kind of ticking along. And then all of a sudden, instead of going down, maybe it could precipitously go up. Uh, and uh, uh, we thought, you know, is this possible? And uh, we came up with, with some examples, uh, such as maybe the origin of life um, was a case where if you kind of think about the expected value of Earth, uh, it may have been that life is extremely rare uh, and that it would be very low. But then once you have this kind of very unlikely beginning of life, uh, that things just get vastly better. Um, and uh, this kind of opposite of a catastrophe. Uh, and uh, Owen and I are a big uh, Tolkien fans and, uh, um, and happened to know that he'd invented a term for exactly this kind of thing um, that came up often when he was talking about fairy tales and how often at the end, there was this kind of sudden dramatic reversal of fortunes um, where things are almost miraculously solved um, and had this idea of it, calling it a, a U catastrophe, EU catastrophe um, from the old sense of catastrophe as a sudden turn of events. Uh, and so th the idea would be that this opposite of an existential catastrophe would be this existential U catastrophe um, and that the corresponding concept to existential risk would be existential hope. Um, the, the, the possibility or probability uh, that they take this sudden positive turn of events. And it's easy to see in some cases how this could happen. So for example, in this case where we enter this terrible global totalitarian setup where there's only a 1% chance of escaping, 
you can see why we'd all be hoping that we could, you know, against all the odds that we could overthrow this and actually get back to freedom and an open future. Um, so in that case, it's quite clear that you could hope for something that really does turn this around and, and you know, make the world vastly better than we had any reason to, to believe. But it could also be the case that there are ways we could do this even from our current situation, um, where there are possibilities that are not in any way default, um, but where things could get really much better. Um, and uh, hopefully that will be, you know, uh, I imagine alison has been <laughs> thinking about these things quite a lot. Uh, and then finally, I'll just say that uh, um, my current thinking is, uh, is leaning towards the definition in terms of potential. Um, and I would say the main reason for that is, um, is actually that, that I think the potential based definition points more directly to why it is an existential catastrophe would be so bad or what it is about it that makes it bad. Um, it's kind of a more helpful concept for, um, for what, what kinds of things we're actually worried about. Um, because it tells us that what makes extinction so bad is that there's no more options um, for doing anything. Our entire kind of set of options, including some exceptionally good ones, has all gone. Um, and that a very bad outcome has been locked in. Um, and that uh, it's this kind of extreme lock-in or irreversibility that's making it bad. And that another way to think about that is that our potential is restricted. Um, whereas if you just define it in terms of that there's a sudden drop in the expected value of the future, then it's, it's almost risks just being a bit thin and trivial a definition that obviously big, that basically that's saying is a big bad thing happens. <laughs> um, uh, and it's kind of, it, it's less helpful in pointing to the kinds of things we're actually talking about or to identifying them. Um, it's so it's, its generality is kind of a virtue, but also in some way means that it's saying less. Um, and we could actually be pointing much more precisely to the types of things we're concerned about with this other definition. But ultimately, I do think that they're still both um, good ideas. Uh, and I'm also interested in discussing, you know, uh, with a uh, existential hope within this kind of idea of, um, of a definition based on potential. I think there's still room for thinking about these kinds of ideas, albeit they might be a bit trickier to express. So uh, that, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Toby. Already a lot of uh, thoughts and questions and reflections in the chat, uh, but we'll get uh, to hear Alison before, and then uh, you two can uh, discuss and we'll take everyone's uh, questions and collecting them presently. Please continue to, to share uh, your thoughts, everyone, and uh, we'll get to them uh, really just after Alison. All right, uh, thank you so much, Toby. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen uh, in case I break off or something. Uh, I will turn off my video and perhaps others want to do the same. It should all work, but, uh, but you never know. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. I have my presentation up already. Now I just need to share. Um, let's see. I hope this works. You can tell me uh, if it does. Does this give you the full presentation? Okay, great. Lovely. You can see it. All right. So uh, this is perhaps a website that some of you know, it's called existentialhope.com on which we have uh, been trying to collect um, an onboarding document for the next generation. Uh, and it is very much a volunteer uh, driven and not uh, not perfectly updated effort. And it's not an effort that I want to talk about today. Uh, I just wanted to mention it to segue into uh, the incredible uh, inspiring paper from uh, Toby Ott that he's just introduced you. I think uh, the main concepts of uh, being new catastrophe and existential hope. And uh, reading the paper has really signaled a turning point uh, in, uh, I think in, in, in uh, yeah, my life <laughs> wouldn't even be said too much. I think definitely in my uh, professional career, I think um, it, it was definitely this kind of more hopeful uh, approach a more optimistic approach, uh, deeply optimistic uh, approach, I think to the future that I think uh, we've been uh, kind of lacking, um, uh, especially in our generation uh, a little bit. And so I just want to thank you again for uh, for just writing this paper with uh, with Owen, uh, of course. And so, um, yeah. Anyway, so I think given from this paper onward, um, I think a lot a lot has changed, and um, for me, uh, particularly in my career. But I think generally, um, also leading up to that. Uh, there was a time when uh, I just uh, kind of like uh, joined Foresight and whenever I think uh, I, I, I felt a little bit too much doom and gloom, I went back into our archives and I actually thought that back in the days, like 30, 40 years ago, people were fantastically hopeful about the future and had really, really big dreams. So this is from the Extropy magazine in 19... 
94 and it's uh, one a few future predictions and we don't have to get into whether they're right or wrong or whether they're too optimistic or not but safe to say people had really really long-term plans and long-term visions about the future that i don't think many of us uh, currently do have so i think that you know this was definitely one of the uh, one of the uh, moments where where i thought well Back in the days when there was much less technology online than we have right now, people used to be pretty optimistic about the future. And so they didn't only have uh, grand ideas, but I also think they really had uh, really grand prototypes and were actually um, putting their money where their mouth is and were creating really great technology. So I just want to give you uh, today a history of the future in five hope inspiring innovations uh, that were generated in much of the Fossa community, which is many of you. So many of you in the audience have worked in, in, in one or two of those items. And just to Give you a little bit of an idea of i think the types of ideas that we could be having again and the types of i think uh the types of hopeful um yeah the types of hope, hopeful projects we could be launching again um which i would certainly like to see more of so i think this is the first one this is dolphin uh, that uh, gail pagamet and jim uh, jim bennett uh, uh, worked on and that was in 1984 and it was the first uh, private and the first um uh, water or ocean-based uh, rocket launch attempt uh, and that was in 1984. And I think I spoke to Gail and she said one of the hardest things about this wasn't actually uh, launching the rocket up, but it was actually just getting uh, um, getting the allowance to be able to do this. So there was a lot of political work that went into this. And I think if we now look at SpaceX and take that for granted as a technology that we just have, I think going back and just looking at how much work went into just making those things possible back then when it wasn't quite clear whether this was legal at all, uh, I think is to, to me tremendously inspiring. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it just, I think, thank you, <laughs> gratitude to, to those guys. And also let's let's pay it forward. Let's let's keep going. Another one is this this particular object here. It's the American Information Exchange from 1984, uh, a project uh, that many uh, in the fossil community have worked on, including also uh, Gail, uh, Chip, uh, Randy Farmer. And it was basically, uh, it was much before the web uh, when all that you could, uh, could do together, information was reading journals and so on, but they didn't really answer specific questions, but you kind of have to look through there and kind of, see find out where where different bits of information would be that you could then use and then those guys came along and what they did is create kind of a consultancy so an, an ideas market where you could put a request in for a, a type of document that you would want a question that you would like answered and then someone else uh, who, who thought that they have an answer could offer you an answer back and you would uh, arrange an agreement on a specific uh, monetary value and then uh, that consultancy could uh, could, could could go on. And so I think this was really inspiring uh, because it had never existed before. And uh, not only because it also included reputation systems, but because it was kind of one of the first smart contracts ever out there. And uh, it had a very specific type of contract. It was a split contract in the sense that uh, it had one of the first smart contracts in the sense that it had an escrow-like arrangement. So I could uh, demand a document. You could uh, you could say that you have submitted that particular document. We would escrow in the money. But then also, if I then said that it wasn't the document that I had actually wanted, uh, then we could open up an arbitration uh, mechanism, and that would then turn it over to an actual human written contract that we'd have on the side. And so there was this gamification uh, um, element in between switching between automated and uh, and uh, and human made contracts. And so I think it was a much more creative way to think about contracting than we have right now. Now everyone just seems to either want to automate everything or or nothing. And so I think those hybrid systems uh, really, I think, inspire a lot of hope for thinking about technology infrastructures of the future. Next one up, we have Habitat. Uh, this was from Lucasfilm in 1986, where Chip uh, Morningstar and Randy Farmer also worked on. And this was one of the first virtual worlds uh, really that was ever out there in which multiple people could uh, could uh, could communicate and gather in the same virtual space. And now we're all re very used to, I think, a lot of really fantastical VR worlds and so on. But I think back in the days, this was it. They just uh, they would just put a bunch of people in the same virtual environment. Uh, they uh, they had different types of objects that you could inter interact with, including even weapons. Different types of societal structures formed. They formed a police uh, to to get rid of all the folks that were were turning crazy in the uh, in, inside of the inside of the citadel and so on. So much of the I think the kind of um, legal prototyping that many of us want to do right now and the kinds of governance structures that we want to be forming and that we're experimenting with in those virtual worlds right now and uh, all the talk about those virtual volunteer communities and how we're at, already existing at the intersection thereof, that all actually dates back all the way to 1986. And this is how it looked like. And so I think tremendously inspiring for many of the uh, virtual worlds that many of us cohabit uh, in and uh, one of the ones that we're joining gather i think you know looks quite like this so uh, this is just uh, another one 
uh, then uh, I think there's I think two or three more to go. Project Xanadu, I think many of you uh, here know this. Uh, and I think many of you know uh, the types of problems that we have with the web that we have of today, right? Where we talk a lot about echo chamberization, we talk a lot about polarization. Back then, Project Xanadu, 1960, mind you, right? Was a project back then that had a really, really ambitious vision for the web, which was that you couldn't only have one directional links in uh, following a link into one direction, but instead you'd have two directional links. So if I'm reading a document, I can't only read the document, but I'm also reading all of the objections that are made to specific claims that I'm making in that document. And so I think this is uh, what better way to fight uh, eco chamberization and polarization uh, than having uh, different links between the different silos. So again, a really, really tremendously inspiring project. Here you even have different pop-ups and, and a lot of the features you see now in fantastic projects like Rome. So again, I think this was 1960s, like it's incredible really. Uh, and then um, last but not least, we have ideas, futures from 1999. Idea Futures is a uh, term uh, developed by Robin Hansen, uh, even earlier than that, but we had the first Idea Futures actually running at our Foresight Senior Gathering in 1999, where people bet uh, real money, uh, and then uh, afterwards proceeded to send us checks into our office <laughs> to be able to participate in those futures. And we had really, really fantastic and pretty ambitious, uh, I think, future, um, uh, future bets that people uh, made here, which you can see on the right, and Chris Hibbert um, was really instrumental in keeping this project going. And you know now we have uh, many of the engines such as Metaculous and even some like uh, Augur, which are blockchain based that uh, many in this community value and, and contribute actively to. And I think you know they came, uh, I mean, they're not uh, significantly related in any sense, but I do think that you know just looking back at what they were already able to do in 1999 uh, with paper money, uh, I think was uh, was really, really inspiring and in thinking this, this forward. So, um, mm -hmm. Perhaps why am I telling you all of this? So I'm telling you all of this. Uh, if you look at this is the kinds of goals that those systems were trying to do. Those are the systems that I just told you about. But we tend to always be stuck in this column. So we tend to look at our technology infrastructure and just think that they were kind of handed down to us from God. And uh, we don't really have very much, uh, very much context for uh, the types of technology and infrastructure that we're operating in. And I actually think that looking backwards, and seeing um, towards the early beginning and towards also how ambitious early pioneers were and where they wanted to go with those infrastructures, I think also opens up that window to then look that far into the future and to kind of uh, contextualize yourself as perhaps being one part of a really multi-generational open source project of civilization. So looking back that far, so whenever you're working on a specific aspect of a positive long-term future. I encourage you to just think back, go into the archives of whatever project it is that you're working on and think about uh, or look research, what do people want to build back then? And uh, are you are your visions big enough? So either are the prototypes that you're building big enough that we can actually have a really long-term vision for what we're trying to do as civilization? And um, if there are really long-term visions, are there bits that you could still work on that haven't been fulfilled yet? If there aren't any, then at least come up with uh, with visions that are as ambitious and I think as 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 long term or have have as long term of a scope as they used to back then and build the version three uh, thereof and uh, to visualize the whole thing because I think sometimes visuals help we tend to conceptualize as ourselves as kind of having been dropped into the civilization and it's just kind of up and running um, but I think that sometimes looking that far into the past and actually realizing how hopeful and how on, on how yeah on, on what shoulders of, of which giants we're standing right now and uh, what kind of work they've done. And I think Toby points this also out in the precipice, right? Existentialist is not only sad because of the future loss, but also because of all of the uh, all of the work that our uh, ancestors have done to get us to where we are. I think this loss really shouldn't be shouldn't be forgotten. And I think we should look back in gratitude, but also uh, contextualize ourselves as the for, uh, as the next uh, building block towards building a future system and have a little bit of hope that we can build really long term structures, because ultimately, we are one iteration in this more long-term game of civilization. And I think the next moves that we are making will significantly impact the, the playing field that we leave for future generations. Uh, and so I think that we will uh, now leave the structures in place um, that will determine the knowledge that uh, future players will have at hand uh, when they solve their problems. So I think we should, we owe it to them to, uh, to aim high because that's what our ancestors did. And that's what uh, got us to this fantastic civilization that we inhabit today. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. Um, this, this was really great. Um, okay, questions uh, to, from uh, Toby to Alison or from Alison to Toby? Who wants to start? I have one immediately. Uh, but, uh, okay, well, 
So Toby, uh, you not only have written Existential Hope, but obviously also Precipice, which is a book in case uh, some of you on this call haven't read it yet, which I really, really encourage people reading. I think it made Christine Peterson say that Toby Ord is the Carl Sagan of our time, and I think totally rightfully so. Uh, I think that, uh, well, in that book, um, you know, you're, you're talking about the concept of existential security. Um, and to me, always this concept of existential hope and existential security are definitely two driving forces that I have in my life, but sometimes they conflict in my head. So I want to I wanna ask you, how do you think about those two uh, how do you square the two together? Like one, uh, this more focus on mm -hmm. maximizing the probability of an okay outcome. On the other hand, this really hopeful uh, um, uh, narrative of uh, something extremely good happening. How can you think positively about the future without being Pollyannish? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's uh, it's Nick Bostrom's phrase, um, maximizing the probability of an okay outcome. Um, I think by okay outcome, though, he basically means a nearly optimal outcome. Um, so I think he kind of is strangely underselling it in that particular phrase. Um, as, uh, uh, yeah, as that's, that, that's what it kind of boils down to. Um, so in the precipice, I talk about existential risk in terms of potential, as I, as I said. Um, and I, I mentioned that uh, we need to preserve our potential in the sense that we don't want to uh, make choices which just cut off you know, parts of the space of what we could achieve um, without having very carefully worked out that that doesn't include some of the best things that we could, we could achieve. Um, if we make uh, irrevocable choices, I mean, one example that, that might actually sound very tempting to people on this call, or here are two examples. If, uh, if we had unbridled um, genetic uh, engineering, um, and we had a kind of, you know, let's say we had safer genetic engineering uh, on the germline uh, and that we had a very libertarian approach to it where anyone could, could do whatever they wanted. Um, uh, that would kind of fragment humanity um, into many different and increasingly disparate groups. Um, and we would lose something that we have now, which is a kind of essential unity of humanity. Um, similarly, there was a diaspora of humanity. I think that one of the greatest things humanity achieved was settling the earth, um, including many locations which are just, you know, completely uninhabitable by kind of naked humans. Um, we had to invent our kind of spacesuits of like clothes and space habitats of, of buildings before we could settle um, lots of the parts of the world. But, you know, we managed to do this and, you know, to, to explore and find all these places. But we actually lost contact with each other and we became... Um, we didn't even know that people existed in other parts of the world. Um, uh, but then with the age of exploration, um, we kind of found each other again. Um, and unfortunately, we kind of messed that up. But we, we did a pretty bad job of uh, reuniting. But eventually, after quite a lot of trouble, um, you know, we've got a fairly global world today um, where we've got some kind of feeling that we're all in it together. Um, but uh, if we had this kind of like, you know, very disparate pathways or if, if we settled other stars and you know just let people kind of travel off and settle whichever places they wanted you know either of these cases would be another kind of diaspora where there'd be this fragmentation of humanity now that may be that the very best outcomes achievable involve lots of different paths all being tried in parallel and a huge diversity of futures but we'd really want to know what we're doing before we did something like that um, because we might forever lose this this rare situation where we were kind of unified and we could you know consensually make decisions about our future about you know rather than perhaps end up in some um, tragedy of the commons where we could never kind of break out of it or, or you know perpetual conflict so it's kind of ideas of preserving our potential but there's also this idea of something which i think of as protecting our potential which is not merely that we don't lose options, but rather that we put in place the structures needed um, that, to ensure that, uh, that our potential stays high. Um, so this could include something, you know, I, I talk about it as potentially coming up with a constitution for humanity. Um, so some kind of uh, bedrock or foundation um, that of things that we're not going to allow ourselves to do. And the idea would be that that um, I think a lot of existential risk can be understood in terms of lock-in, that we're locking in bad outcomes. Um, but maybe the only thing we want to lock in uh, is that we can't just unilaterally lock in bad outcomes or something like that. Um, so like, like requiring a supermajority in order to make some of these choices. So, you know, you, it's not the case that anyone can just unilaterally found new rivals to earth, but rather that, um, you know, at least 
50% of Earth has to agree that now is the time to start doing that or something like this and to try to uh, um, you know, establish some kind of constraints for the future um, to go more carefully. So there's a kind of idea of, and of protecting our future. And existential security is based on this, um, is this idea of um, getting ourselves to a point where we get existential risk low, and then we also keep it low. Um, and we put in place the structures that make sure that it will be kept low. Um, and that makes a lot of sense in terms of potential. Um, you could also understand it in terms of expected value, but it's a bit trickier. Um, and so it's a kind of related concept, as you say, um, because it's about um, preserving our potential, um, but it's not, as, it's not the same in terms of saying, why don't we try to get way higher than we're kind of currently thinking is even possible, <laughs> uh, which is also um, uh, a great idea. <laughs> Um, I mean, another, another thing that you could add within this space is trying to really make sure that we actually fulfill our potential at some point in the future. Not just that we have this potential, um, but if you're worried that, that if you're less optimistic than me, that we're just naturally going to fulfill it if we keep it for long enough, um, then you might want to kind of put in place more things to really kind of guarantee that we do actually reach for the stars in some manner and really try to achieve the best outcomes we could. Um, what I say in the book is that uh, ultimately our job is to protect um, uh, our future and to protect humanity's long-term potential um, because only we can do that and uh, can protect it from the, the risks that we face in our time. Uh, and then in that way, we'll, we'll give our children the pages on which they can write our future. Um, so that where they can fulfill our potential. People, maybe not, maybe not our children, maybe our grandchildren or some, some further uh, generation can actually be in a position to fulfill this potential. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, and conversely, uh, Toby, do you have comments or, or questions for Alison? Uh, I mean, I, I'd just be interested in knowing a bit more about uh, what you're thinking about uh, existential hope. Well, okay, <laughs> without, without- it's Very general. Up, yeah, without opening up too big a box, I think a, a box here, I think, yeah, I mean, to me, it it seemed really strange that we have, uh, if, if we look back into the past and look at how much people back then thought that the future could be, and, and currently we seem to be a little bit, I guess, yeah, we, we're just not lifting our gaze up high enough. And I, and I I mean, I know that this stands into some conflict with the, with the concept of existential security, because if you're reaching really high, then how can you make sure that your, your base is secure, right? Um, but I do think that sometimes, even if what you're aiming for is existential security, I think sometimes just first realizing that it's useful or that it's valuable that we have a future at all. I think that's a point where many people are almost struggling these days. And I don't, I don't mean to just say, okay, let's just uh, pick the best bits uh, from the top and let's not secure our basics anymore. I'm well aware that uh, you know, existential risk is definitely something that we have to have to address first, and that should be a priority. But I also think that some people don't even do. Uh, the first uh, the first leap anymore and uh, and and have kind of uh, forgotten uh, that that it's really really valuable that we have a long term future at all so i guess i just want to um yeah i just want to try to crowdsource ideas again and try to update a few of the um i think previously really really inspiring visions that mostly came from science fiction but where there's also a lot of a ton of really uh, of, of non-fiction work uh, that was out there. And so I tried to collect that on this website. Obviously it's, it's a very, 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 very version one type of uh, type of process and I invite everyone to, to contribute to it. But I do think that unless we make uh, people aware of the fact that there's something positive to collaborate and to cooperate towards, we may uh, even perhaps get sooner get stuck in Hobbesian traps in which we more fight about the short term and, and, and about the things that we don't want rather than trying to, uh, trying to work uh, collaboratively a little bit more towards the things that we do want. So I think that this hopeful aspect is really inspiring to me about the concept. And yeah, and I would be super keen to hear from our participants as well, because I, I think that many of you uh, are, are providing a, a lot of existential hope to me on a daily basis, but all the contributions that I get from everyone in this community on a daily basis. I, I just want to say, I totally agree with that. And that um, that's something that motivates us a lot at the Future of Humanity Institute uh, here at Oxford, uh, that, uh, a lot of people assume that we must be all kind of gloomy, um, you know, this kind of doom and gloom aspect. Um, uh, but ultimately, no, we're, we're people who are very hopeful for the future. Um, we probably all used to be some kind of, you know, um, 
uh, techno utopians or something when we were uh, teenagers. Um, and then we kind of noticed that there was this, you know, double-edged sword of technology. And we want to really do something about that in order to ensure that we can get all of the best aspects of, uh, of the future. Um, so I think generally actually very hopeful and um, idealistic people. Um, and it's this, this hope that the future could be so much uh, better than the present and also so much longer than the present, you know, just as the past is much longer than the present. Um, and that, uh, and, you know, so many different ways. Uh, at the end of the precipice in the final chapter, I really focus on kind of my vision of, uh, of sketching out our potential. Um, and, you know, I, I characterize it by these different, three different dimensions of, um, of duration, uh, just really kind of spinning out into the future of like, you know, that the typical mammalian species will live about a million years, uh, that uh, if we can live until uh, the sun makes the earth uninhabitable, that's about a billion years. Uh, but if we can, you know, that's a long time to work out the, what you need to do space travel properly, since we can already actually do space travel. Um, and uh, we should be ample time to get to other stars, in which case there would be trillions of years before uh, new stars stop being formed. Uh, so uh, really kind of trying to you know, get this idea of just how vast the amounts of time are, and also just how vast the scale is. How there are uh, there are twenty trillion, sorry, twenty billion galaxies uh, that uh, uh, that are reachable uh, in in our universe according to our best understanding of cosmology at the moment, uh, and that uh, that it you know that doesn't seem to be anything preventing us from you know spreading out into space and you know exploring all of this and and doing something wonderful with it. Uh, so. You know, and then a third one is the quality uh, that our, each of our lives could be could be so much better than they are now, as evidenced by the fact that our peak experiences are clearly so much better than the everyday experiences that we we can see that that um, that there's no kind of fundamental reason why we couldn't have uh, uh, much greater parts of our lives at these peaks instead of just being you know um, one moment on one day in the year or something like that. Uh, so. You know, looking at these three dimensions, I, I try not to kind of commit myself to a particular vision, although I think some people should, but I decided not to in the book. Um, so I thought it was useful in the book to just sketch this kind of three dimensions to show how vast this, this potential is um, and how there must be some really amazing futures in there. Uh, but I leave it to others to kind of pinpoint exactly which ones they think would, would be best in that space. And I think that science fiction has a huge role to play in that. And it's quite sad that there was this turn in the 20th century towards uh, dystopian uh, futures that where there's only kind of relatively few exceptions. Uh, and I think that that's a, a great shame because I think we really do need to inspire people about our future. And far too many people are ambivalent about um, risks to the world because they're ambivalent about the fu entire future. And I think that's a real shame. Fantastic. Well, there are so many uh, good questions in the chat. Um, oh, we better get to them. <laughs> I'm going to take uh, David's question by uh, popular voting, and David, I'll just uh, unmute, unmute you, um, and please ask your question. Uh, okay, the, the first one or the second one? Um, I think the is, second uh, one has more attraction. Okay, um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to... Um, find what exact because I had had a couple of things. Um, so yeah, you, you gave you give a one in six chance that humanity um, dies out uh, in, in the book um, in the coming century. Um, and I wanted to know what your thoughts were about the uh, kind of remaining five sixths of the probability distribution and specifically um, what what percentage of that is a U catastrophe and I, to, to kind of narrow that down a little bit. Um, you know, what, what are the odds that things end up, you know, 10 times as good now or a hundred times or a thousand times as good as it is now? That's uh, fascinating. Uh, I have not thought that much about the other five, six. <laughs> I think some of the other five, six would be things that go pretty seriously wrong, um, but, but are short of an existential catastrophe. Um, uh, but as you point out, my apparently gloomy one in six chance that we, we don't make it is also a five, six chance that we do make it through the century with our potential intact, in which case we've actually, you know, quite possibly got through the most dangerous century we'll ever face. Um, uh, so it is, you know, pretty positive on that side. Um, but yeah, I, I'm afraid I, I really don't know. Um, uh, and it partly depends on, you know, these subtleties of the definition as well. But I do think that to some extent, realizing that the universe is so big 
um, is almost like one of these. It's kind of an epistemic version. But when we discovered um, that, uh, that the planets, these dots that move around in the sky are other worlds, um, you know, the size of the earth um, that were hitherto unexplored um, when we were out there, when we discovered that the stars uh, were other suns, uh, each with their own other planets, and that there were so many that they're kind of blurred to a uniform milky white and we couldn't distinguish them all, that there were billions of them. And then that some of these smudges in the sky were into entire other galaxies or island universes as we thought about them. Uh, and now that there are perhaps uh, 20 billion of them that are reachable. Uh, this kind of vast expansion of like this, the sheer scale and also over the duration of time that is achievable. I think that in some ways that's, that's somewhat like this, this kind of massive opening up of the space of possibilities compared to what we thought uh, we could achieve. And, and that hasn't really showed signs of stopping. We, you know, we think we've seen as far as we can see and so on, but uh, uh, Max Tegmark has a great graph of like the size of the universe over time as to how large we thought it was. And um, uh, it's quite fascinating. And, uh, you know, every century seems to uh, keep going up by quite a lot. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I got lucky and my question got voted, so I'll ask it. <laughs> it was that, um, so in the precipice, you dedicate a whole chapter to pandemics. And so I was really curious to know, um, because this chapter was very discerning in the light of the current events. So um, looking at uh, what happened and even beyond pandemics, what uh, does the way humanity um, reacted to COVID and managed uh, the situation says about our ability to deal with uh, macro challenges and uh, tackle existential risks in general? Yeah, um, it, it wasn't great. Um, uh, it was uh, somewhat, somewhat disappointing. Uh, um, the science seems to, you know, the at least vaccines seem to have exceeded scientific expectations. Either that, or they were lowballing it for everyone, um, you know, so, somewhat problematically. Um, uh, but I, I, I would have thought one of the things that kind of kept me hopeful uh, as well is that, well, it's difficult for governments to invest a lot on existential risk when it all seems so speculative. But if we really looked through our telescopes and saw an asteroid that really was on a collision course for us, you know, we would be kind of getting everything done. There'd be kind of things like, you know, the size of the Manhattan Project, you know, would be like, why wouldn't you be? All of this GDP is going to waste if we don't use it now. We might as well do it. You know, it's a no brainer. Um, and yet uh, with the coronavirus, you know, we're losing trillions of dollars um, of economic damages and we're not putting it in any kind of comparative, like, you know, efforts on actually um, stopping it. Uh, so, uh, so that was that was disappointing to see what what you know it's a little taste of what governments would do when there is a clear and present danger, um, not an existential danger, but a but a danger um, nonetheless. And um, so that that and the international lack of international cooperation um, and kind of damage to international institutions were both uh, uh, fairly disheartening. Um, that said, uh, I think that it has. So we, I think I learned were mainly negative, uh, but it's also changed things in a way that makes such events, uh, the unthinkable has kind of become more thinkable again. I think that for those of us at my age, uh, I'm 41 um, or younger, um, we didn't really live through the Cold War, at least not in our, in our memories. Um, and we didn't kind of see uh, people kind of rally together around um, avoiding the existential risk of nuclear war. Um, and uh, the idea that that this coronavirus really could be worse than anything that's happened since World War II as a, at the international level, you know, a bigger world event uh, than anything like that. It just kind of felt like, well, that's just not going to happen, is it? Or something like that. And even those of us who, who thought, you know, we followed the maths, it still didn't feel kind of real or something um, until it actually happened. And I think that having had that kind of come real is really going to change, you know, the way that uh, that people think about this. They'll be able to entertain things which are 10 times bigger than that, you know, now. Um, whereas previously that would be far beyond their window of what's reasonable to think about. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, I think Joy also had a question. Joy, I'm going to unmute you. Hello there. So we currently live in the only intelligent life generator or even life generator that we know. And it has this nifty self-maintaining climate system. So given that we are the first species that has ever managed to 
develop self-improving, you know, iteratively improving technology and force multiplication. And we're doing kind of a sketchy job of it. You know, we're, we're like the first birds, you know, barely, yeah, we can fly. Wow, we're awesome. Barely get off the ground, right? And we think we're hot stuff. So uh, how much have you thought about protecting the ability of Earth to generate new intelligent species if we aren't the ones that make it, if we goof and we need somebody else to pick up the torch and run with it? So I haven't thought, I mean, it's a good question. Um, I haven't thought that much about that. I know uh, Paul Cristiano actually has written a bit about this, um, including, you know, really taking your idea literally and, um, and uh, it, like encoding messages uh, to future intelligent life forms to warn them about like, you know, here's the kind of technologies we were messing around with, you know, assuming that we've then gone extinct um, and things like that. And uh, imagining how profound it would be if we'd found a message like that from a previous intelligent uh, organism uh, that was now gone and, uh, and it was addressed to us to say, don't make the mistakes that we made. Um, that, would, that would be pretty powerful. Um, so he was kind of thinking it wouldn't actually cost more than say $10 million to actually kind of like generate such messages and kind of like ways of li like writing to aliens, you know, these kinds of ideas about how you could communicate to a very different culture and then kind of hiding it like in a kind of like place with say a radioactive signature or something. Um, that's really literally taking that, that one seriously um, in some way. Uh, but I, I really don't know. Um, I don't put too much stock in um, this kind of saving throw we'd get where if we screw up that something else comes along and utilizes this kind of remaining um, 500 million or billion years that the earth has uh, in order to kind of really make a mark uh, on the, the really long-term future. Um, but uh, that's mainly due to my lack of imagination or lack of thinking about it. I think that I would encourage other people to, uh, yeah, to, to look around and think about some of those ideas. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, now Creon, I think, uh, got the next one. Creon, I'm asking you to unmute. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think that um, actually um, another person had a better version of my question. Uh, who was that I spoke to in the chat? Um, but the question was about, like, I see if I heard you correctly, you were suggesting that there that there might be uh, wise to have some sort of super majority uh, uh, approval of any off-world expansion. Did I hear that correctly? Um, yeah, I, I was thinking okay, there. Okay. I heard yeah. that correctly. That's all I want to know. Now, it, what I want to do is say, you know, I can understand some of the arguments that one might make for that. It also seems like you might end up quite likely to throw the baby out with the bathwater because um, a tyranny by the supermajority that keeps us on Earth forever, because quite frankly, a lot of people who don't know much about um, about much of anything tell you things like, "Oh, why are we spending money in space when we have problems here on Earth?" When you know, first of all, we're not spending money in space. No one's ever bought anything in space. But you know, aside from that triviality, it's like, um, yeah, you you a supermajority, i.e something close to totalitarianism, uh, telling everybody they have to stay home. Well, look, we've got that right now. So it's a, it's a good point. You'd, you'd wanna be pretty careful about this. Um, but I, I, what I'm worried about is the current or perhaps future laissez-faire approach where even a very small group could just, you know, if nanotechnology is developed, for example, um, and a very small group, you know, just decided to send some self-replicating thing out to the nearest star. Um, uh, it could be that that the you know what happens to the whole rest of the galaxy ultimately comes down to what that group decided to put on that probe. Um, and so, I'm worried about things like that. But maybe the the answer isn't that you need a, a supermajority. Maybe the answer is just you need five percent of the Earth to even think it's a good idea or something before it's at least reasonable. That in that case, it's still some worries about like what would happen if there was a space race or something where, um, where say uh, two superpowers both had their own plans to try to quickly try to um, gain resources beyond the Earth. Um, so, okay, you know, stuff, but, but you're right that there's a balance to be struck, and it's not clear where to strike it. Yeah, and I'd like to just mention one follow up here. I mean, I, I totally agree with this, and I'd love to have endless conversations with you about this. But the thing is, is that um, even if we accept you know, one of these kind of design rules for uh, our spacefaring uh, future. Uh, 
as in theory, there's the issue of um, realism, right? And unfortunately, we can you know postulate all these governance structures, but it's arguable that um, you know things are kind of running away, or or there's just it. I wonder how much time we should spend theorizing about the ultimate governance to make these decisions versus you know actually trying to start something now because the decisions are being made in a distributed yeah. manner. Oh, I mean, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, the amount of time I spent thinking about ideal governance structures is, you know, a few hours or something. That's why my idea might not be so good about the particulars there. Um, but uh, that's not something I've been spending all my time on. Uh, and I suggest in the book that we should be thinking um, at all levels about kind of incremental improvements, for example, um, debates about the Artemis Accords or other forms of like changes to space law, um, but also questions about new institutions, say, within the UN structure or perhaps, uh, you know, alternatives to it. Um, I think we should be thinking about all of these levels. And one thing to note is there are occasional junctures where we can make very big decisions. For example, after World War II, when the entire current international order was really established um, with the UN, et cetera. There was a time when we were just creating UNs and World Banks and things like that. And that time may come again, and it could be useful to have, have some good ideas uh, you know, up our sleeve when it does. Beautiful. Uh, thank you, Toby. And um, I guess with two minutes uh, remaining until we hit the end, um, a question I would like to ask you too is how we can, how do you think uh, a community like ours um, has, can support your mission, um, really contribute to the effort of um, avoiding uh, existential risks and mitigating them? Uh, and if there's like some particular leverage that perhaps uh, such a such a group uh, can can help with, you know, um, and uh, better than like an individual would. Mm. Um, I guess I don't know everyone's kind of skill sets and uh, and so forth here. Um, um, I do have a have a section in in the precipice. Um, uh, in the this penultimate chapter about how you know different ways in which I think that people can use their careers in order to help with these issues. Um, one of them that's obviously relevant to this group is is starting a public conversation about this. Um, I think that we uh, we can move to a situation where it, it doesn't sound crazy to be talking about um, uh, protecting humanity's long term future as like a as one of the most important moral issues of our time. At the moment, I think people will be like, what are you talking about exactly? You know, I don't understand. Um, but I think that we can change that. Um, but it involves uh, serious people you know, uh, talking about it in a way that, that has a certain kind of like depth to it as well, um, that doesn't just sound like a, a very nerdy kind of dream. And I think that, that this group sounds like exactly the kind of people who you know, uh, can talk with, with quite a bit of substance to what they say when they talk about these things. Um, so kind of starting and improving this public conversation, I think, is one of the key aspects. Why, thank you. Um, well, right on the hour, um, I want to say a massive thank you for joining us today. This was so much uh, good, like ideas, content. Uh, the chat is just um, totally uh, insane, over overloaded with uh, good idea and debate. Uh, we are going to be continuing this conversation in our foresight uh, lounge in Gaza town, meaning it's gonna be a more uh, decentralized conversation. Everyone can interact with anyone else. Uh, so, you know, mark uh, your interlocutors, the people you've been discussing with in the chat. I will share the link uh, in a second. And um, yeah, uh, that will be all. I will be uh, in Gaza as well. Alison, do you want to say uh, one word for the end? <laughs> Just thank you um, for for this fantastic conversation, uh, Toby, to you and, and also for the chat. I couldn't keep my eyes over it. It's, I think, and Toby, it, it, it's well worth saving after this chat. And I look forward to talking to you all on Gather. And thanks, Toby. It was, uh, I think, yeah, it was very special for this community to have you. Thanks for joining. Well, thanks. Us. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Toby. Um, and yes, everyone, I am posting the link to the gather room and you can just uh, jump there. Reminder that this only works with um, 
Chrome or Brave as browsers. So if you are on Firefox, you may want to switch. And I'll see you there. And I will see you. Um, we have upcoming on March 5th, a uh, sci-fi writing workshop uh, for specifically uh, existential hope. So following the idea that we cannot create what we cannot imagine, we'll be trying to think about uh, which futures we want to work toward. That um, our next keynote session is with Daniel Schmachtenberger, and we will be discussing um, sense making and how to uh, build our civilization ability to 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 be resilient and to well make sense of the world to process information efficiently um, and uh, yeah we will also have like a mid month uh, social session so I'll see you uh, hopefully in any one of those um, you can find me in the gather room to ask me any questions about the group uh, and yeah thank you all for coming today bye.